Um, as Carlos said, we spoke yesterday about the crisis of the world economy, which has taken its sharpest form in the European Union. I'm going to argue that the political imbalances of the European Union are just as stark as its economic ones, and that the conventional solution to these power asymmetries, to bolster the European Parliament's powers of co-decision, is a dead end. This will draw on a text that will be published in the forthcoming issue of the Spanish NLR. I'm going to look at how these political imbalances have emerged in three distinct dimensions. Political democratic asymmetries between the rulers and the ruled. Interstate asymmetries between the different member states and geopolitical asymmetries characterizing the European Union's role in the world. I'll trace how these imbalances have emerged in response to three exogenous shocks. The imposition of the fiat dollar system in the 70s, the fall of the Soviet bloc in the 90s, and the world financial crisis in 2008. Each exogenous shock in turn ushering in a new regime of accumulation, the neoliberal assault of capital against labor from the 70s, the era of globalization and the rise of China from the 90s, and the current age of debt-logged stagnation, which doesn't yet have a name. It's been said that while the American economic system has transformed itself with unparalleled energy, the American political system has hardly changed at all since its foundations. The institutions designed by the 18th century planter aristocracy are still in place. The same could be said of the European Union. The architects of European integration were born in the age of the horse-drawn carriage. Monet and Schumann in the 1880s, Adenauer in 1876. The institutions they designed embodied a very 1950s view of a modern, united Western Europe. A supranational technocratic executive, the European Commission. An interstate council of ministers a European Court of Justice and a Parliamentary Assembly, an ambitious ensemble. This strange institutional complex contained a finely balanced set of relations. In geopolitical terms, European integration was very much a Cold War project, forwarded by the State Department. But for its founders, it also embodied the hope of Europe as a third force, independent of both the United States and the Soviet Union. In terms of interstate relations, the core French-German axis offered a balance between French military and diplomatic strength. France had a seat on the UN Security Council, an overseas empire would be an independent nuclear power, and German economic weight. Strategically, France wanted to tie its bigger neighbor down in a diplomatic compact under French leadership. Germany wanted to regain its status as an established world power and win French support for its eventual reunification. These two were flanked on either side by the smaller Benelux countries swimming in Germany's wake who supported a supranational framework which offered them a larger stage and by Italy, more closely aligned with France. In political democratic terms, the Treaty of Rome was the construction of political elites. The electorates were not consulted. 
but there was no strong popular opposition to what remained in the high growth period of the 50s and 60s, a rather distant construction with the bland but unobjectionable goals of stability and economic prosperity. The first exogenous shock to hit this Europe of the six was Washington's imposition of a fiat dollar system, cancelling the Bretton Woods Agreement amid the intensifying economic conditions of the competition of the 1970s. Europe's response was to create a European monetary system based on the Werner Plan as a bulwark against international currency turbulence. For this, Paris lifted the veto on British membership imposed by de Gaulle, who had warned that the UK would serve as a Trojan horse for US interests, with every justification. French policymakers now argued that the City of London would provide vital financial ballast for the Werner Plan European monetary system. Well, the Werner Plan was a failure, of course. The core economies diverged, Germany powered ahead, the others weakened, and the other currencies had to be devalued against the Deutschmark. But the conjuncture of the 70s and 80s and creeping neoliberal hegemony altered the equilibria of the European community in other unintended ways. In geopolitical terms, the record was mixed. With the overthrow of dictatorships in Portugal, Greece and Spain, the European community discovered a new vocation, expansionism, combined with political and economic engineering in its near abroad, building up capital-friendly centre-left parties, the Portuguese socialists, PASOC, PSOE here, and shepherding the countries into NATO, as Spain well knows. But the project of Europe as a third force was weakened in this period by NATO's hardening stance, symbolized by the arrival of US cruise and Pershing missiles in Europe. The Trojan horse was very much inside the walls. Thatcher was a forceful ad advocate for Washington's views and for neoliberalism in the 1986 Single European Act. In political democratic terms, the conjuncture of the 70s and 80s, the Europe of the 12, was rather successful. There was real popular support for the European community here in Spain and successful referendums in Britain and Ireland. Popular living standards were generally rising. Despite the Single European Act, the project was seen as both socially liberal and mildly social democratic. The interstate dimension was strengthened by regular summit meetings at the European Council, matched at supranational level by direct elections to the Parliament. In terms of interstate equilibria, this seemed to be a golden age for the Franco-German alliance, with Delors leading a dynamic commission and dramatic German growth. But in retrospect, French diplomatic and political leadership was already being squeezed from the West, both by the growing British role in the 1980s, but also internally through the erosion of goalism by Atlantic liberalism within the French media and intelligentsia, an Atlantic liberalism that was hostile to any independent strategic thinking. At the same time, German economic power was accumulating in the East, the balance between the two core states was starting to change. The second major exogenous shock was the disintegration of the Soviet bloc, the end of the Cold War framework in which European integration had been conceived. The first question this posed was the unification of Germany. Would it be neutral or inside NATO? Second, how would an enlarged, united Germany alter the internal balance of the European Union? And third, what relation would Europe have to the other ex-Soviet bloc states? The question of German reunification would provide the key to the rest. The choice here was between two paths, 
The first was the full democratic constitutional process foreseen by Article 146 of Germany's basic law, with popular input and consultation. This approach was implicit in Helmut Kohl's 10 points of November 1989. But this would mean throwing open the question of neutrality or NATO membership, on which the West German political leadership was divided. Oscar Lafontaine, the SPD candidate for chancellor, was a proponent of neutrality. German public opinion was also against the expansion of NATO. Washington, however, made expanded NATO membership a condition of German unification and swung its whole weight behind Kohl, who now called for fast-track accession by individual new lender to the Federal Republic as it stood, that is, inside NATO, under Article 23 of the Basic Law, an obscure mechanism which had been used for the accession of the Tsarland in the 1950s. The Soviet leadership balked at this at first, but the oil price was so low in 1990 that they gave way in the spring um, of that year and settled in the end for a 15 billion Deutschmark loan. That was the price for the expansion of NATO. To the second question, how Europe could contain the inordinate might of a united Germany, the French answer was a technocratic fix, the Euro. Unlike the 1970s Werner Plan, which, as Michel Aglietta has pointed out, envisaged a collective fiscal policy with a strong social dimension, the Delors Plan turned upon an inflation-targeting central bank. Mitterrand was convinced that winning Kohl's support for this was a historic diplomatic triumph. Though, of course, many warned at the time that the single currency of the Maastricht Treaty would not neutralize German predominance, but enthrone it. How were the asymmetries of the EU affected by the Maastricht era? In political democratic terms, Maastricht brought a decisive widening of the gap between rulers and ruled. For the EU, as for Germany, the concern of the ruling powers was to avoid any constituent democratic process after the end of the Cold War. The architecture of the Euro system was deliberately designed to be immune from electoral pressures. The 1950s institutions were given a few tweaks, adjusting voting rights, creating new top jobs, and the status quo was dressed up in the guise of a constitution with free market competition inscribed as a foundational principle, one of the main reasons for its rejection in the 2005 referendums in France and the Netherlands. These popular majorities against the post-Maastricht direction of the EU were ignored by Europe's rulers, as was the emergence of an organized Eurosceptic politics in England. With the shift to neoliberalism, the Maastricht era saw the end of any real policies for a social Europe, just as structural unemployment was starting to rise. Leveling down replaced the leveling up of the 12, widening the gulf between above and below. In terms of interstate relations, the Maastricht settlement created a series of new structural asymmetries. The establishment of the Eurozone bloc led to intensified integration in the core, with the centrifugal dynamic on the periphery, notably affecting Britain. Within the Eurozone, a new hierarchy of member states emerged in response to the constraints of the Stability Pact. Strong states like France and Germany broke the rules with impunity. Portugal was forced to comply. Third, expansion to the east from 2004 abandoned the principle of member state equality. The Comic-Con group, already poorer, joined as second-class citizens in terms of structural funds. The eastern states were recruited individually on a hub-and-spokes basis, reducing their bargaining power. In German terms, this was enlargement by Article 23, not Article 146.
In geopolitical terms, the end of the Cold War brought not an independent Europe, but fuller subordination to US military leadership under an expanded NATO. In this sense, the 1999 war on Yugoslavia was an exemplary operation, led by the United States with the German, British and French forces and ideologues playing auxiliary roles. The third exogenous shock, the 2008 financial crisis, has given the imbalances set in place by Maastricht an extraordinarily toxic twist. The upshot has been, first, a striking expansion and hardening of autocratic executive control by the Commission. And second, behind and above the Commission, an unprecedented centralization of power in the office of the German Chancellor. In a polity that once prided itself on the rule of law, power at the summit is now extra-legal and personalized. German hegemony, or more accurately, semi-hegemony, was not the outcome of a unilateral power grab. It was wrought, step by step, in the course of the two-year political struggle over the Eurozone crisis. The relation between Washington and Berlin during the crisis is an object lesson in the operation of international hegemony. As Timothy, Ge Timothy Geithner, US Treasure Treasury Secretary, told Schäuble and his staff, you can put your boot on the neck of these guys, the Greeks. This is quoting from the transcripts of uh, Geithner's memoirs. You can put your boot on the neck of these guys if that's what you want to do. But Berlin must also give the financiers what they wanted. Germany had to guarantee the interest payments of the Greek state's debt rather than let Greece default. And it had to permit large-scale bond buying by the ECB, contrary to German monetary tenets. France was a key US ally in this, but the US Treasury campaign was also backed by most of the European political establishment, including the German SPD, and by the international media, which portrayed the investor bailout as a progressive, mildly social democratic move, and lamented Germany's reluctance to play the hegemon. No guarantees without control, was Merkel's famous answer. Every German gesture towards the financial markets, the European stability mechanism from 2010, the long-term refinancing operation in 2011, the outright monetary transactions in 2012, which was Draghi's whatever it takes. Each of these was matched step by step with an extension of autocratic executive power. The European semester system, the Euro Plus Pact, the fiscal compact, and so on. And step by step, Germany's economic weight was leveraged into political primacy. German semi-hegemony, still quite limited, rests above all on the tacit recognition by the other states that the investors and the US Treasury see the German Chancellor as the executive head of Europe. This is precisely the combination of overblown finance capital and political power that Bob Brenner was describing yesterday. The dollar Wall Street system, as our, comrade, our late comrade Peter Gowan described it, here exercising its hold over the European Union. Ah, popular protest. Um, how have the outcomes of the Eurozone crisis... <laughs> how have the outcomes of the Eurozone crisis affected the asymmetries of the EU? In terms of interstate relations, the finance capital solution to the crisis has given birth to a German Europe, as Ulrich Beck has described the very outcome that, German, that European integration was designed to prevent. The core Franco-German balance has been destroyed. France has been eclipsed. <laughs>
The international establishment view of France, which I'm sure is repeated word for word by El Pais, is that the French economy is too burdened with statist legacies for France's views to have much effect. But the figures don't bear this out. In terms of public debt, household income, infrastructure, manufacturing, France does much better than Britain. The Franco-German balance always depended on French diplomatic, not economic, superiority. At the end of the Cold War, France failed to fight for an independent Europe outside NATO with democratic con constitutional controls to limit German preponderance. Instead, it called for a central bank solution, the euro. During the Eurozone crisis, France failed to offer independent leadership to the other states, Spain, Italy, Greece, and so on. Rather than fighting for an alternative strategy, Paris backed Washington's policy for German control in exchange for saving the financial sector. But that always included a degree of German control over French policy as well. Now, this past month, Schäuble's men in Brussels have been deciding whether or not to pass the French budget. In terms of geopolitical imbalances, Berlin has taken charge of Europe's Ukrainian policy in a manner that would have been unthinkable before the crisis. Since Maastricht, the NATO-EU symbiosis has had a built-in expansionist logic. Having trampled on the 1990 neutrality understandings with Moscow, it has advanced across most of the ex-Soviet glacis and is now poised at the edge of the Donbass Basin. The sub-imperial arrogance of European leaders is not the only factor in the Ukrainian catastrophe. Thousands dead, reports of a million refugees. But it has been a contributing cause. In political democratic terms, the stark class politics of the bailout and austerity regime has put a heavy strain on representative democracy in member states, and we'll be discussing the implications for that for Spain later. Establishment parties are resorting to grand coalitions, as in wartime, to defend the status quo. National coalition governments, government by cartel, as the Irish political scientist Peter Mayer called it, has replaced the two-party system altogether in Greece. Even in Spain, I hear Felipe González has spoken of a grand coalition against Podemos. The growth of the anti-EU far-right, especially in France, where the Front National won the Europarliament elections, has been one of the morbid symptoms of the crisis. More hopeful, but still very fragile, is the growth of a new left, Syriza, Podemos, but also really surprising signs like the No to Water Charges movement in Ireland, which is mobilizing over 100,000 people, and the radical character of the Scottish independence campaign. These are both movements that seem to come out of nowhere, found a political form, and have attracted large numbers of people, and I think that's perhaps one of the most hopeful signs of the moment. And we can discuss the nature of the five-star movement in Italy. And a lot of these mobilizations are, have an ambivalent political nature. Defenders of the post-Maastricht EU have a very simple answer to these imbalances. In three words, the European Parliament. With each expansion of European Commission control, there have been nods towards a compensating extension of the European Parliament's powers of co-decision. What does this mean in practice? The objective of co-decision, as the term suggests, is consensus, agreement in this instance between the representatives of the Commission, the Council and the Parliament on the exact wording of the torrent of regulations and directives that are poured forth, hugely increased under the single market. 
The committees where these regulations are brokered are a famous target for corporate lobbyists. Parliamentary procedures, the nitty-gritty of co-decision, are managed by the bosses of the two main party caucuses, the centre-right European People's Party and the centre-left Socialists and Democrats, who operate as a grand coalition. They were first established by German parliamentarians in the 80s and have continued basically along those lines ever since. Given their massive majority, any agreement that these two leaderships broker is bound to be voted through in plenary sessions in Strasbourg, with the MEP's arms rising and falling automatically, according to instructions from above. When new outsider forces were elected, the left and the greens in the 1980s, Eurosceptics in the 90s, the party bosses offered them funds, offices and support staff to join this party group system at lower levels, proportionate to their size. The rebel forces were smoothly absorbed into the parliament's mechanism for neutralisation and consensus. The co-decision dynamic is reinforced by etiquette. Dragging out meetings by refusing to agree and that's the only um, effective form of rebellion, is considered bad form. This consent mechanism of the Parliament was on full display during the Eurozone crisis. The party boss system orchestrated Parliament's assent to every extension of autocratic power, fast-tracking some of the most egregious measures. Once the outcome was assured, they posed as people's champions by tightening up one or two loopholes in the Commission's directive to limit bankers' bonuses, classic politics of the fig leaf. Across Europe, representative democracy and national assemblies have been losing power, but the European Parliament is farther advanced than any of them in terms of non-accountability and the absorption of parliamentary structures into executive administrative power. Accountability here only operates upwards. The need to achieve a consensus with the Commission and the Council if any amendment is to have effect. Never downwards. The European Parliament bosses never have to answer to party memberships at annual conferences. They are non-recallable, their seats guaranteed. The model is that of 19th century parties of notables, run from above, rather than 20th century mass parties. The European Parliament is not nothing. It has become a substantial institutional entity. It occupies over a million square metres in Brussels and pays around 10,000 officials and aides in addition to its 751 MEPs. It has accumulated significant bureaucratic weight and by the logic of institution building it fights for more turf, better seating and a greater role within the EU's dominant structures. Europe's autocratic lurch since the crisis has come as a golden opportunity for the Parliament and its supporters, who claim that it alone can provide compensatory legitimation. The political logic of this bid for influence was illustrated by this summer's campaign to get Jean-Claude Juncker, the disgraced former Prime Minister of Luxembourg, appointed as President of the European Commission. The treaties are very clear that the Council should select the President for the Parliament to endorse or veto, but as part of their push for influence, the Parliament's group leaders, above all Martin Schulz of the Social Democrats, Guy Verhofstadt of the Liberals and Danny Cohn-Bendit for the Greens, have been insisting that each group would choose a candidate for the Commission Presidency. The group that got most votes in the 2014 European election would consider its candidate the rightful head of the Commission. In practice, the European Union has rarely lived, rarely never lived up to its declared respect for the rule of law. But this was really riding roughshod over the treaties, a grab for power dressed up as facade democracy.
the centre-right group's choice of Juncker, an archetypal practitioner of EU crony politics, was presumably meant to reward an old friend. Juncker had been forced to resign as Prime Minister of Luxembourg in 2013 for covering up a massive spying scandal involving illegal surveillance, dirty operations, bribery and corruption, and responsibility for a bombing campaign, covering responsibility for covering up a bombing campaign that led back to the palace. He was uh, forced to resign having presided for 18 years over one of the most laxly regulated financial sectors in Europe. The centre-right group duly won most of the seats in this year's election. It actually got the votes of 12% of the total European electorate. In the new informal polity of post-crisis Europe, where power is personalised in the German Chancellor's office, it was naturally assumed that only one person, Angela Merkel, could rule on whether the decrepit Spitzenkandidat would be appointed to Brussels' top job. Merkel's decision was prompted not by German national interests, Germany wants to keep Britain in the EU as a fellow Conservative force, but Juncker's appointment was a gift to Britain's Eurosceptics, but by Merkel's domestic position. In Germany, a grand coalition between the Springer Press and liberal left opinion declared that it would be scandalous if Juncker failed to get the job. Habermas said it would be a bullet to the heart of Europe. Merkel duly adjusted her line to reap the benefit of this media campaign, and Juncker was anointed Commission President. It defies political logic to suggest that this extra-legal annexation of powers by the Parliament amounts to a democratisation. Juncker is not accountable to the European electorate, not even to the 12% of it that voted for him. He is de facto accountable to the figure who actually appointed him, the German Chancellor. The distribution of posts in his new commission and a unilateral creation of special vice presidents, all of them hardline pro-austerity figures, bears this out. This was the entirely predictable outcome of the Spitzenkandidaten process, and in my view the left group in Parliament should have known better than to lend it legitimacy by going along with it, constructing their Alexa Tsipras list. This was a mistake. It is one thing to participate in the European electoral process and to make the most of the possibilities for transnational solidarity and debate. It is quite another to lend credence to the notion that Parliament's egoistic pretensions and turf wars make the European Union more democratic. The business of the European Parliament is co-decision. It cannot structurally supply the one essential component a functioning democracy requires, opposition. In the final chapter of his book, Buying Time, the German sociologist Wolfgang Streich outlines very beautifully the socially heterogeneous landscape that a genuinely democratic constitution for Europe would have to recognize and represent, encompassing without suppressing the interests of countries as different as the Netherlands and Bulgaria, Finland and Portugal. Extensive federal subdivisions would be needed to balance regional autonomy with collective solidarity and determine what fiscal claims each part should have on the whole, and vice versa. This is the diametrical opposite of a perspective that would stretch Europe's archaic political institutions into a unitary and autocratic continental government with an unaccountable co-decision assembly serving as a democratic facade. Finally, how should the left tackle the political imbalances of the European Union? The organising question for us has to be, what obstacles block an equitable solution to the crisis, political, economic, social, 
objective and subjective. The task of the intellectual left, as Bob Brenner said yesterday, is to shed as much light as we can on these obstacles, to clarify their character and their weak links. The first set of obstacles we confront are the, those of our domestic political systems, which are imposing the bailout and austerity policies. Here, the Casta, if you like, the PP Soe transition regime. But behind the national government stand the powers that forged the Washington-Berlin consensus on the crisis. An immediate priority is to reveal their character, their operations, their instruments, and their allies, and to attack them root and branch. Mm -hmm.